that's and that's where this policy doesn't doesn't jive with reality because we need it we have the resources and we're ignoring all of the economic drivers of the world's fifth or fourth largest economy my name is mike maselli and this is the energy show with rei energy where we're energizing your investments and maximizing your tax deductions Today, we're going to be talking about failed energy policies, and you're going to discover how a lack of education leads so many new energy policies to fail. My guest today is Mike Umbro. Mike is the founder of Californians for Energy and Science. Great to have you on the show today, Mike. Great to be here and great to meet you virtually. I appreciate it. Yeah, I've wanted to get into, you know, California. They've kind of been the forefront of all of the electric push and, you know, green energy push. And it seems like they've got some pretty wild policies out there. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my company, we've, we are, I think the second largest interest owner in the thumbs unit out in Long Beach Harbor Harbor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, We've been a, we've been a, you know, a participant. We're not an operator in California. I mean, we looked at some projects there, but uh, we've been a participant in California for quite a while. And, Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what do you make of all this that's happening out there where they're trying to destroy the oil and gas industry? Yeah. You know, you being there a while, you know how good it is in California. And I think that's one one of the saddest parts about what's happening to the industry is the rich history, the future potential and the self-sacrifice via policies intended to absolutely eradicate the industry <laughs> and it's <Yeah>. it's devastating <laughs> it's devastating it's like you know you we we both it's like you kind of shrug and chuckle about it because it's otherwise it's just downright depressing it's it's really it's sad it's a tough situation out here yeah it really is i mean california i think at one time they were the number one energy producer in the united states weren't they absolutely and we're still the number two consumer so, <laughs> you know, that's and that's where this policy doesn't doesn't jive with reality because we need it. We have the resources and we're ignoring all of the economic drivers of the world's fifth or fourth largest economy. It's 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 just insane. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show and, you know, mm-hmm. I told you I'd had a Mayor David Taft on our I mean, excuse me, David Nord on our mm-hmm. show. Uh, in the past. And uh, he was talking about, you know, how California imports oil from Ecuador. And that's kind of Mm -hmm. insane, isn't it? (laughs) It is, especially considering where he is in Taft, California, where I was two days ago filming some content to try to bring the oil field of California into the public, you know, discourse, because it's, it's, it is insane. We're, we're saying, we have the California Environmental Quality Act. We want to provide the template for really the rest of the country. We're, we're just the leading edge of the environmental movement broadly. And that has been so fouled up and distorted that now we're importing an inferior product from the Amazon rainforest, inferior from an environmental standpoint, uh, where you have what the environmental community calls the lungs of the earth, the rainforest. And the the very idea that you could look at a place like Taft, the west side, you know, of the Central Valley of California, where you're probably receiving less than four inches of rain in a normal year. There, you know, the biodiversity just is not even comparable. Um And oh, by the way, the community of Taft was built to service the oil fields in that region. It was put there by the people to make money for the people. And again, going back to Ecuador, you've got indigenous people in this case that are saying, hey, whoa, we've lived on our own for thousands of years. We don't want you in our rainforest extracting this product these are the very indigenous people when you know different different regions but you come back to the indigenous communities of california and across the country that we want to protect right the environmental movement says we want to protect these people and so it's it's just devastating sorry to get so far into that topic but you asked the question it's 
it's more than just an import situation. It's look at the, you know, everything the environmental community wants to pride itself on is being violated in that one, just that one trading partner of Ecuador. Yeah, I know your organization. I mean, you try to put out education to try to educate people on, you know, what actually is happening. And and I'm not sure a lot of people in California really understand that they're destroying the rainforest to import oil into into the state of California. I mean, nobody understands it. it, That's the problem. And and I've talked about this uh, a lot recently that because nobody understands it, the 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 environmental groups that are electing the policymakers by by way of you know just campaign dollars and challenging in primary elections if they don't vote the way the Sierra Club wants the Sierra Club you know <laughs> for you to vote if you don't vote the way they vote um you know that's the biggest microphone and so the Sierra Club is electing these policymakers that because the public doesn't know how any of this works they can run rampant over the industry and and just railroad it. It's over. Is that what kind of led you to start Energy and Science Organization? That along with trying to do it as a developer. And I think that I come from a finance background where I was, you know, partnering private equity with management teams to develop upstream assets. That's a whole different game than actually being the developer. And and after taking that step in 2017 to to pick up a lease in in West Kern County with two partners that have amazing technical background and experience in the region, um, actually trying to permit and develop a project. And then this environmental movement that is totally distorting reality. uh, Those were the two drivers to start this group, for sure. And I'm not so sure a lot of people out there, you know, that obviously are consumers, you know, they don't really understand that, you know, the United States is probably one of the cleanest countries. I mean, as far as oil and gas production and, you know, we have less carbon emissions than than just about any other country out there. And mm-hmm. yet they continue to try to destroy our industry. Exactly. And and to the point in California where they're sending drones up to look above facilities to to look for potential leaks meanwhile you're you're sending a drone above the Los Angeles basin i mean there's no you know you're 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 over landfills you're over the port complex of LA and Long Beach you're over the 405 freeway with you know like i said where the number two consumer of gasoline and diesel behind texas in the country So there is no scientific methodology behind, you know, sending a drone up and trying to pinpoint these emissions in in the Los Angeles basin without, you know, field level accuracy. And so it's yeah, it's it's just it is comical. It's like there's just no rhyme or reason to some of these methods. Uh, But that's why we need a group like like California's for Energy and Science. That's why we need. folks that understand from an engineering perspective how facilities operate on the ground from an environmental perspective with so many environmental professionals and you know just applying for permits and you're you're under vapor recovery in a in a tank setting situation and you're saying wait this would be a massive failure if we have a leak we're going to know if we have a leak but now you're sending a drone up and you're telling us well it must be the oil and gas community and by doing that the agencies really are failing to identify the true source of emissions if they're, you know, unhealthy for people. You know, you can't just scapegoat one industry because then you're not actually rooting out the the damaging, you know, the damaging uh, sources for the environment. Kind of like all the wildfires, right? Where they don't clear the underbrush and yet they wonder why they, you know, have these humongous wildfires out there. Exactly. And then and then they're so humongous that they wipe out all of our greenhouse gas emissions going back since we've <laughs> we've started <laughs> tracking them under the Air Resources Board, you know, 20 some odd years. Um, and it's just like, well, let's just keep doing what we're doing. And there's there's no um, adjustments being made um, in a meaningful way. Wow. 
So how does lack of education lead to so many bad energy policies? Uh, that's such a that's what we're trying to change, really. Um, the lack of education. Uh, the best example I can give, I was given the opportunity to guest lecture at Haas at UC Berkeley uh -huh. at a course on energy and civilization. And I gave them just the truth, the data about what California is consuming, where it's coming from, what it looks like from a local perspective, what it looks like in a foreign setting. And um the surprising thing most people said to me in the industry, oh, why you're going to Berkeley? They, you know, they they hate us. They want to shut us down. Overwhelmingly, the students that I spoke to after the lecture said, thank you for presenting this information because it's another side of the coin that we don't hear every day in our in our courses. And so that's what we're all up against in California. But I think nationwide is an education system where, how do you say this without, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in the education system. I, I, I've, I've gone to school a number of times, even late in life, but where, where the, the science is not being presented in a holistic manner and yeah. it's, and it's biased and it's, you know, the, the, the studies are set up with confirmation bias and, um, methodologies that you're taught to avoid when you're studying true science. So that's what we're up against. And so education, it's, it's like, we've got to start somewhere. Uh, and we, we should have started 30 years ago because we're late. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, as far as, you know, a lot of people, I mean, uh, well, our industry in general, you know, we have problems with effectively communicating you know, the benefits of, of the industry. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of young people don't really realize because, you know, growing up, I mean, obviously you just expect to walk in your house and flip a switch and the lights come on. You don't, you don't really understand where the energy is coming from. Right. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it just works. That, yeah, <laughs> it just works. And yeah. uh, so, so many people don't really understand. Well, if you go and all of a sudden you got a bunch of windmills and solar panels and, you know, right. I guess a couple of summers ago when it got so hot in California, they were talking about people couldn't charge their electric cars. Oh, yeah. And, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So then what do you do? <laughs> exactly. I think maybe the maybe the opportunity is because energy and climate is such a talking point, specifically for the younger generations. Um, you know, I was at soccer practice and one of the moms said their son wanted to be an a, electrical engineer, build EVs or something like that. And, and I'm like, wow, you know, this kid's seven years old. So, <laughs> may, you know, I think hopefully since they're all looking at, I guess, electrify everything movements, um, maybe that's a teach teachable moment that we can yeah. then say, hey, yes, that's right. And uh, in a place like California or Texas, natural gas is the backbone of your electricity grid yeah. and you need it and without it you have freezes in texas that uh cause real you know devastating effects and deaths with people freezing to death uh and in california you got hey you know you bought that ev now don't plug it in because we don't have <laughs> enough power it's um so hopefully these things are teachable moments and i think sadly it's the availability crisis and the affordability crisis that will cause the younger generations to wake up because they're going to quickly realize I can't afford anything without, you know, my mom and dad supporting me. <laughs> I mean, people are going to, they're going to get out of college and say, wow, this, this is just, I can't pay for these bills. Yeah. Especially when you got, you know, electric cars, I think the entry point is somewhere around 30 to $40,000, you know, just to get into one. And then, you know, what's the life expectancy of those batteries? I think they're only eight to 10 years. And then the right. car's really not worth anything when you get ready to trade it in. You know, exactly. it's just, a, it it's just people don't really understand. And, and where all these rare earth minerals come from, I mean, you get them by using diesel fuel in order to mine them and using heavy right. equipment. You're not going to go out there with solar panels and, and mine these rare earth materials. Right, right. And I think hopefully that, we're coming to a, a, a moment where we realize, well, we, we need to mine them here then. There's big talk of 
uh, in Imperial Valley down near me uh, in mm -hmm. San Diego, East County, east of San Diego is the, you know, the Saudi Arabia of lithium. But, you know, it's commingled with several other nasty constituents that you got to separate out of that lithium brine to to make a, a battery product. And um, I think we'll realize as policymakers and developers how hard it is to produce these elements for the energy systems we're, you know, we're basically mandating into existence. Uh, we're, we're learning how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you've probably talk to a lot of politicians and you know i know polit you know these people aren't stupid a lot of them mm -hmm. obviously are you know they're they're well educated people or come from business backgrounds and but when you get a governor like gavin newsom who comes out and says we're on the cutting edge of eliminating fossil fuels mm -hmm. i mean you know how can how can these people actually say that with a straight face i think i think they've been given some cover by the fact we had we had the pandemic we had this artificial drop in demand overlaid by a regulatory regime that has effectively shut down permitting in the state and then the state continues to to run so then it's just it's this perfect storm of political cover of saying yeah see we don't need those things we don't need to produce those things oh it's only five dollars a gallon that's because big oil's price gouging you and I think we as an industry suffer because it's, you know, the, the major operators don't really have effective public relations, as we all know. Um, and then there's this timidness about speaking out because are we going to, you know, are we going to get out of favor with the political regime and not get permits if we speak out? And so there's this whole storm going on where uh, the vacuum that's created gives a, a leader the ability to say hey we don't need that we're going to phase it out i think it's incumbent upon the industry to then really tabulate the data from the emissions side as well as the economic side and i think that's a big window of opportunity the economics in california when you've got a budget deficit of you know 73 billion dollars and growing after coming off of a surplus of a hundred billion dollars, you know, from the pandemic relief money, I think that played into the ability for policymakers to to pretend like we don't need this industry and we can survive without this industry. Well, now when you have to pay your bills, you you're going to want that industry back. So that's what the industry the industry really needs to hit hard on the economic opportunity of fourteen hundred drilling permits waiting to be approved okay that's four or five billion dollars of economic impact the continued jobs of you know three crews on a rig you know adding rigs that continued year over year economics the the tool companies the the service companies okay that's another five billion dollars um, pretty soon you're saying hey if you just kind of open up the San Joaquin Valley, you might have $40 billion of economic impact, Governor Newsom. And here's how we can do it in an environmentally responsible way. That's the bridge that needs to be built. But sorry, that's kind of, I, I kind of got into the whole. No, that's fine. That's, that's ball fine. of yarn there. But um, <laughs> I like to look at the opportunity and I'm hopeful that our industry leaders and groups like Californians for Energy and Science can go to the governor in, in, in a, in a non-emotional way and say, hey, you need money. We can we can bring you some money to the state that badly needs it. Well, and a product. That, I know we've been looking at a deal in California for, I don't know, four years now. And it's a really good looking prospect. And, mm -hmm. you know, but we're just afraid to go out and even attempt it. I mean, you never know. You know what's what's going to happen in the future. So you got people that are apprehensive as far as spending money in the state. You know they're not going to mm -hmm. go out there like you were saying. I mean you got all these permits that are sitting there waiting to be approved, and you mm -hmm. know it 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 just you know it's not worth the hassle. And uh, right. as far as to come out and actually spend money to drill wells. Yeah, it's and it's a lot of stress if it's if it's you know you're if you've got investors. Uh, they want returns. They don't just want <laughs> right. They don't want tax deductions every that's year. True. That's true. That's not the purpose of investing. And yeah. it is. It's it, it's it's impacting 
the ability to really move the the industry forward. I I see the state and the country on the verge of a really a renaissance. It's not going to be a transition. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be out with oil, in with electrify everything. It's it's going to be a a blend of technologies and a blend of energy sources, but by limiting the investment flow into the state, you're not allowing the reservoirs to to make that progress. And I think I think that's a, another situation where the investor community needs to more effectively educate the policymakers as to the value of the reservoir and yeah. what that can be long term. I I I'm just now starting to appreciate it. And I've been on the finance side in the industry for 15 years now. Um, but there's tremendous value to if you want to put carbon down hole, if you want to store heat in the reservoir, if you want to produce power back out of the reservoir, it's not just oil and gas uh, extraction. It's not just, just that simple. So um, I think there's a lot of investment opportunity in these reservoirs in California. But to your point, if you can't see line of sight to the permit and the project phase, then how do you justify putting money into the state? Yeah. And uh, I did want to ask a question. Why Why does California have the highest gas prices in the U.S.? <laughs> yeah. And it's it's these very climate programs. Uh, is that what I it made, is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you've got, um, well, we trade when we're buying crude into the refineries, you're trading on Brent. You know, there's right. no access to a WTI barrel. <clears throat> there's no, a lot of people don't realize there's, there's no pipeline coming into California for for crude oil. There is for natural gas, um, and so we're beholden to to OPEC on pricing. So you're going to have a little bit of an elevated price uh, there. And then the cap and trade tax in California is roughly twenty cents a gallon at the pump. The wow. low carbon fuel standard is roughly thirty cents a gallon. You got fifty cents a gallon just in climate programs right there alone. Uh, and then you add in the other state and federal taxes and you're at about a dollar fifty to to higher. You know, it's all going up as well. A lot of people don't realize cap and trade is a market. They they have to reprice the 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 price of carbon uh, to continue to abate carbon. So that will get repriced next year you're going to see a two to three dollar spread on California gasoline and wow. it will be at seven dollars as kind of a new baseline here pretty soon. <laughs> you know, and one thing that I I don't know if it's appalling or not, but one thing that I do find that's that that is very ingenuous in, ingenuous is that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these so-called green organizations like PETA and some of the other ones, I mean, they really turned a blind eye to, you know, wind energy. I mean, here in Texas, we've got, I think, more wind windmills than any other state. And, right. you know, but 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 you rarely hear them talking about, you know, all of the raptors that they kill, you know, the windmills and, right. you know, and all the dead, you know, birds and stuff like that. And just the sound. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever right. stood under one of those windmills, but they're pretty damn yeah. loud. Absolutely. And uh, and then, of course, now on the East Coast, you have all these wind farms that, you know, they're saying they're disrupting the wells sonar and mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and wells are beaching themselves. But you never really hear that on the news. Right. You, you, I mean, you don't hear right. anything about it because I think a lot of these green organizations, they've just turned a blind eye to it. Oh, uh, completely. And it's and it's all a flow of dollars. It's not about the environment. It's about how attorneys can become environmental activists and run these organizations that are really their their aim is to to file lawsuits against developers to hold up <laughs> projects they don't like and then to force policies that they can you know milk fees out of effectively i think it's terrible when you look at california wants to go from uh, six, I think we have six gigawatts of installed wind onshore in California, which Texas dwarfs. I think you got 20 or 30 gigawatts yeah, of wind. It's, it's a lot. But offshore California, the plan to save our grid is to build out 25 gigawatts of, of offshore wind. 
<laughs> and so people think, oh, yeah, these things are going to be, in this case, in deep water. You won't see them. You won't hear them. Well, yeah, but have you looked at the plans in Los Angeles and Long Beach in the port? They're going to have to build massive docks and massive terminals to bring these blades in from China to then assemble these machines, get them out to sea. I mean, the the amount of impact at just at the port is phenomenal. Wow. And then you're you're looking at, well, how are you going to float a, you know, a, a structure the height of the Empire State Building on top of water anchored to 3000 foot of ocean floor. Like yeah. it's just <laughs> like the engineering doesn't make sense. And then that's when you realize, okay, this is, this is all a grift. This is all a Ponzi scheme, but you know, you're going to tell me you're going to build that kind of infrastructure floating on the water. And here we're standing on top of a reservoir that's, we just have to drill a thousand feet down. I mean, it's like a post hole yeah. and that energy density and it's all these environmental activists that are, you know, really just getting into the energy market by way of, you know, boondoggle. It's just, yeah. it's just, and, and we're all sitting here, like, how do we stop it? And it's just a runaway train, right? Yeah. Now. And sucking our tax dollars. I mean, that's all right. it's about, right. Is just, you know, sucking out American taxpayers money, you know, to yeah. go into all these crazy projects. And then of course, when we get a different administration, then it's all going to turn around. I mean, you even have these, offshore wind companies now, which, you know, most of them were supposed to be, you know, because of the, the act that they had or the law that they passed. I mean, it was supposed to supplement American companies. But if you look at all the offshore wind companies on the East Coast, most of them are international companies. Most right. of them are, you know, <laughs> and so right. I don't know how that puts money back into the U.S. economy because you're giving it all away. And then yeah, now they're, they're, they're coming back and saying they're not economical. <laughs> yeah, there there always seems to be an exemption for the big companies and for uh you know those that can navigate the the market that way. I, I I'm hopeful though that we see more of this federal money spent with small operators because that's that's where the innovation happens. You know, in our industry, that's you you saw the the little independents cracking the shell codes. Um and I think that'll be the same here. And and so yeah, when you see these massive you know, twenty billion dollar projects for offshore wind. It's like who's really benefiting from that? Yeah. It's it's not small companies, and it's and it's oftentimes not innovation that that's, that's going to scale and and be a meaningful positive for the people. And I know the energy industry. I mean, it it keeps trying to innovate. I mean, I think y'all are working on carbon capture and different mm -hmm. types of technologies to make it cleaner. And and uh, but yet those don't seem to gain any traction, do they? <laughs> Well, it's hard because now we're, we're it get it gets back to permitting something in in the oil patch and yeah. the stigma that goes around that when it's you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Hey, I've got an oil reservoir I can put carbon in it. Will, will you let me? Uh, and that's you know that's CRC and Era and Chevron's got some projects like that in California. Um, and then us uh, on the operator side, our company, we're trying to do geologic thermal energy storage, basically. Uh -huh. uh, taking sunlight into a parabolic trough and heating the reservoir and, and storing that heat in the reservoir to produce it back to power a geothermal power facility. And that's hard to permit because you're in the oil patch. And it, again, it kind of gets back to, you know, I, I think we need the federal programs and the grant programs are good if we're trying to push innovation, but we can't be picking winners and losers and we yeah. can't be ignoring um, opportunities just because they happen to be in the oil and gas sector. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't you want to decarbonize oil and gas? If you're saying yeah. it's such a problem and we need these products, how this should be a no brainer. It should all be a kind of a slam dunk. If we're in such a crisis, let's go. We don't have this time to waste. Well, I know you're doing great work. Can you tell our listeners how to follow you, Mike? Yeah, so our website's really simple. I'm surprised it was available when I picked it up. It's energyandscience.com. So three words, no spaces, www.energyandscience.com. We post, you know, what we're doing out in the community on the on the pages there. But if you click join us, you can fill your information out and that comes to us. You'll get our 
our monthly meeting announcements. I send literally two emails a month. There's no spam involved. Uh, you'll hear when we meet. And we want folks from outside of California to, to participate because a lot of these things, you know, just off the top, the methane rule, things are, things are rolling out uh, nationwide and uh, we need help and we need to come together. All right, Mike. Well, great. I enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.